Well, hey guys, here we are in our Revelation studies again. And today we come to the end of this incredible letter. 64 studies. You know, when I started this, I wanted to move through it quickly. Epic fail. Well, let's read our passage for today. Revelation 22, 16 through 21 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. So here at the end, we see the amazing continuity of the Bible, how cohesive its message is. But why is that? Because there is one author. I mean, it's not a compilation of man's religious thoughts like some claim. The Bible has one author who has used many men as instruments, and that is why there is one cohesive message. We see that at the beginning of this book, right after the fall, with the promise of rescue for sinful man. That's Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is what is referred to as the Proto-Evangelium or the first mention of the gospel. We are told that the offspring of the woman, and notice, not the typical offspring of man. So right there we have the first reference to the virgin birth. It says, he will be struck in the heel. That's referring to the pain of the cross, but that will result in the serpent, the devil, being totally crushed or totally defeated. That was the promise which was fulfilled in two stages. First, in the incarnation. Jesus came to earth on a rescue mission, didn't he? At that time, the potential for the forgiveness of sins was provided, and the devil was defeated. That's Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So, the devil has been a defeated foe since the cross. His fate was sealed, right? Though he was still allowed to trouble us, but from that point on, he could no longer force us to go his way. The slavery to Satan and sin was broken for all who would believe. Then here in Revelation 22, we see the victory Jesus won at the cross being fully realized. That promise thousands of years ago was never forgotten. We end up in the end of this letter, and the devil is no longer a problem at all. He has experienced a humiliating defeat on earth and has been cast into the lake of fire. Here the crushing promised in Genesis 3 that occurred at the cross is finalized. And the point is, don't ever doubt God, right? When he says something's going to happen, it's going to happen in his timing and in his way. So with that said, let's dig into our passage. And here we see our Lord offering a final invitation to sinners to take advantage of what Christ has done. So let's look at the inviter and the invitation, starting with the inviter. That's Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. With this, Jesus validates the entire book. These truths, every fantastic promise, comes from him, the God who cannot lie. Again, this is not man's idea of what might happen, a tale of science fiction. This is truth, and this is what will happen. And notice who these truths are for. Look at Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. And so this book is not only understandable to the elite, the professional theologians who spend all day looking into the nuances of Scripture. This is for the church. It is meant for everybody, for all of us, to read and understand. 
You know, so many shy away from teaching this book, believing it's too difficult to decipher. But God didn't put sections in his Bible that are meant to confuse us. And this is what the first verse of this book says. It is the revelation or the unveiling, the revealing, not the concealing of the truth about Jesus Christ and those things that are to come. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, God's children can know these truths. So, this truth comes from Jesus. Then Jesus reminds us of who he is, his authority to tell us this truth. Look at verse 16 again. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Root and descendant of David. This links Christ to the Old Testament. He is both the root, the creator of David, and the son of David. In other words, he qualifies as the Messiah. He is the anointed one God said he would send. He meets that scriptural qualification. Then bright morning star. This links him to the church. 2 Peter 1.19 said, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And so putting these two together then, he is the Messiah who was sent by God to be the Savior. So that's the inviter. Let's look at the invitation. The invitation is in Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Here we have an invitation that is all-inclusive. Anyone who is spiritually thirsty may come and receive the free gift of life. And notice who is doing the inviting here. It's the Spirit and the church or the bride. Let's start with the Holy Spirit. We would expect that considering what he was sent to do, right? Jesus said in John 16, 8 through 10, And when he, talking about the Spirit, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Why was the Spirit sent? Well, it's for many reasons, right? But for the context of this study, he was sent to prepare people to respond to the gospel invitation. And he does this by convicting unbelievers of sin and convincing them of the threat of judgment because they don't believe in Christ. And it's interesting how Jesus links this to righteousness in John 16, 10. Look at that, John 16, 10 again. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Jesus says the Spirit has been sent to convict the sinner of sin. And then he links that to righteousness. Why? Because the Spirit works hard to shatter any idea of self-righteousness in the sinner he's speaking to. And why is that necessary? Because mankind is really good at deceiving themselves about their own personal merit. I've done a lot of witnessing, and it's so common to speak to those who believe they are righteous enough to make it into heaven. So the Spirit comes to convince the unbeliever that they are sinners, that they are unrighteous, that their own morality, their own religious zeal, their own sincerity, while it may be good on a human level, it falls short of what God requires to get into heaven. Paul wrote in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, therefore they're in trouble. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death or hell. So the Spirit was sent to convict man of sin, convincing them that they're not righteous, and because of that, they're in trouble. That they must be, that they will be judged. Because, why? Because it takes righteousness to get into heaven. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, what is righteousness? We've got to figure this out. The righteousness required to get into heaven is a 100% compliance to God's holy law. We could call it moral perfection. That means unless God has a solution, we're all in trouble, right? Because none of us are morally perfect. None of us has kept his law without fail. Well, fortunately, God does have a solution. And so the Spirit was sent to convict man of sin, showing them that they're not righteous. And the Spirit was sent to show sinful man that Jesus is righteous. Here it is. You're not righteous. He is. He is that source of righteousness we need. Now watch the way Jesus puts it. John 16, 10, again, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Why is Jesus going to the Father? That's the resurrection, isn't it? Linked to righteousness. 
This is so important to see. This, the resurrection, proves he lived the kind of life the Father accepts, that he was righteous. The resurrection proves that. Well, how? Well, let's work this one out. You're going to have to think with me in this one. Now, remember what the righteousness that gets somebody into heaven is. It's a perfect compliance to God's law. No moral failure at all. James 2.10 puts it this way. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So here's the point. If Jesus had sinned as a man, just one sin, he wouldn't be allowed into heaven. Why? Because he wouldn't be righteous. Now, of course, we all know Jesus didn't personally sin. So no problem, right? Well, not so fast. There is the problem of our sin. Again, watch how this works. To be saved, our sin must be dealt with, right? The way that happens is through what is called imputation. That is an accounting term, and that means that our sin, the sin of every believer, is transferred into Christ's account, and as our substitute, he becomes responsible for its payment. But what would happen if he can't fully pay for that sin that is now in his account? That sin, our sin, that he has become responsible for. Let's say he's able to take care of 99% of that sin, but 1% is left. Now here it is. That 1% would keep him and us out of heaven. Remember what James said? James 2.10, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So that 1%, that one sin would mean he's not righteous, and we need his righteousness to get into heaven, don't we? But here is the great news, the great assurance Jesus gives us in John 10. John 16, 10 again, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, the resurrection. So we look back on that scripture and we say, yeah, that happened. He has gone to heaven to be with the Father, the resurrection, which is proof he did pay for every sin of every believer that was placed into his account. If he didn't, he wouldn't have gone to heaven and neither then would we. This is why we can call the resurrection a receipt that is stamped paid in full. It is the guarantee that every one of our sins that could have kept us out of heaven won't. So, Jesus being in heaven is the undeniable proof that gives every believer the assurance that God has nothing against us. But if you don't know Christ, I pray the Spirit right now, hopefully through this message, will be speaking to you to convince you that you have sinned against God, that you have fallen short of what he requires to get into heaven, but God has provided a solution in Christ, and the resurrection proves that solution was effective. Christ did everything that was necessary for your salvation. You can escape the judgment you deserve if you'll place your faith in him. So the Spirit does the inviting, and my prayer is he is doing that right now. Next, we see the responsibility of the church in all this. The church, the bride, also does the inviting. Look at Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Now, I mentioned these truths are meant to be understood by the church, the bride, and here we see the church is to use those truths to reach out to the lost, inviting them in. This is one of those primary tasks the church has been called to as Christ ambassadors. It was the final command to all of us as Christ was on earth, right? Known as the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is important for the church. It's important for the saints in the church. To not care about evangelism is dangerous spiritually. A.W. Pink said this, if a church does not evangelize, it will fossilize. It'll lose its life. It will shrivel up. And the message we can give them, we've already seen in verse 17. If you're spiritually thirsty, God has good news for you. God offers to you the free gift of life through his son, and whoever will may come and receive it. Therefore, if you don't and you perish, that's on you. It's because you chose not to respond to his gracious invitation. In verse 17, we have the importance of a soul, don't we? Then in verse 18 and 19, we have the sanctity of Scripture. Look at the sanctity of Scripture, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. 
And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Wow, what a warning against tampering with the scriptures, right? Far too many today are willing to twist scripture for their own ends, and I'm amazed at how clever the false teachers are at making everything speak about money. And what I mean by that is you giving your money to them. I once got a paper, just to show you an example, I once got a paper napkin, cheap little paper napkin from Robert Tilton. Flee from him. Supposedly, he had traced his hand on it. It was just basically a handprint printed on this napkin. And he told me if I laid that on my body, I would be healed. Then, of course, he gave me the opportunity to send money to him with the promise that God would bless me greatly if I did. But does God bless us for supporting false teachers? I doubt it. Now, the scripture he was twisting for his little napkin fiasco came out of Acts, Acts 19, 11, and 12. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. It's interesting. I just saw that Peter Popoff, or Peter Ripoff, is offering the same thing and twisting the same scripture right now. These phonies have changed the gospel of grace into a gospel of greed. But should it surprise us that false teachers use scriptures falsely? I would not want to be in their shoes when they stand before a holy God. But I digress. Back to the scripture here. What is God doing here? Well, he is officially sealing up his book. We could say he's locking it up. Therefore, there will be no new revelation. That means whenever somebody truly gets anything from God, it will not oppose or undermine anything found already written in his book. And when somebody says they have a new revelation, you know, first of all, be careful. Again, there is no new revelation. It may seem new to them, but it must line up with the old truth that is already given. But right about now, I think we need some balance because I don't want to throw good teachers under the bus. This is not speaking of teachers who handle God's word with integrity, who work hard to understand, but have made honest mistakes in interpretation. We've all done that. John MacArthur said this, my theology has holes in it. I just don't know where they are. And that's why you need to be good Bereans. Don't trust me. Check me. What we have here is a severe warning to anybody who would willingly misuse this book for their own purposes. The penalty is eternal damnation. And again, can you imagine standing before God like this? Revelation 22, 19, And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. And I can think of so many well-known teachers who are in danger of that, who have chosen to use God's holy word in a deceptive way for their own ends, using the truth that is meant to give life and glorify God to line their own pockets. Peter put it this way, 2 Peter 2, 1, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them bringing upon themselves swift destruction. This is a serious wake-up call to handle God's word correctly and reverently, and a serious call to listen carefully to what these teachers say. You can't just look at what they do. Those supposed miracles, those miracles can be easily faked. And what did Jesus say about the end times, the times we're in right now? He said signs and wonders, false signs and wonders, will be commonplace. Just as Jesus had his apostles do signs and wonders to validate their ministry, Satan will do the same with his false teachers to validate them. So this is a call to work hard in our study, handling God's word with integrity and doing our best to interpret it correctly. Now, Jesus repeats the invitation and closes with the thought of grace. And so the invitation repeated, look at verse 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Surely I am coming soon. Throughout this book, there has been this consistent exhortation to be watchful and ready. And how important that is, especially in the times we live in. To spiritually relax now, right at the end, 
Oh, that would be foolish, wouldn't it? Carrie, my wife, and I exhort each other all the time, finish well. Don't start cruising now. We are in a spiritual race, aren't we? And what do runners do when they're competing? Do they slow down at the end? Do they take it easy? Do they relax? No, at the end, they give it their all. They lunge across the finish line. It's called the kick. And I like what one person said. He said, you want to know if your mission on earth is complete? If you're still breathing, it's not. There is still so much work to do, isn't there? I mean, even in a pandemic, even in a lockdown, absolutely. Maybe even more so now, because people are desperate, aren't they? They need hope, and we have it. We know the one who wants to care for them. Now, let's continue on. Jesus says he's coming soon. Now, you might be thinking, soon? It's been 2,000 years. Yeah, for you, but it's only been two days for God. Second Peter 3.8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. He's going to wrap it all up in the perfect way and at the perfect time, and our job is to remain and be faithful until he does. Now, God ends his book, the Bible, with grace. And I love this, Revelation twenty-two twenty-one: The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. This whole book all the blessings and even the horrific judgments have been filled with grace. For those who respond to this teaching, the offer is heaven to those who only deserve hell. I mean, that's grace, isn't it? And I see grace throughout the book for those who are resisting. God warns them again and again of the cost of rejection. Why? Grace. The judgment we see in the book of Revelation is meant to move the heart and open the eyes so the sinner will respond. See, God is loving, merciful, gracious, and kind, and gets no pleasure in casting anyone into hell. So again and again, he warns so he won't have to. He wants you to respond. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to become his child. So my prayer as we close this up is this. First, that you, if you don't know Christ you would hear that still small voice of the Spirit whispering to your heart, that you would see that you have sinned against the Holy God and He can't overlook it. I pray you would respond by fleeing to Christ as your only hope that you would place your faith in Him. I also pray as we finish this book up that these studies would continue to be found and would continue to glorify God, that many would be led to God through them now and when the church is gone. I pray God would bless this series with eternal fruit. All right, guys, you know, some of you have been with me for all 64 studies. You have prayed for me. You have shared the studies out, and I am so grateful. Thank you. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to tackle Daniel in a few weeks, so hang on. Stick around on Sundays, but for the next few Sundays, I'm going to be putting up some miscellaneous studies that I, I want to teach as I get prepared for the book of Daniel. I'm studying it now. I'm getting my heart prepared. I'm uh, seeing what it's saying. And so pray for me. That, that's a difficult book. I covet your prayers. Let's pray the Lord uses it in a great way. Well, I love you guys. God bless you. And I'll see you next Sunday. And next Sunday, I'm excited about that message. So don't miss it.